and welcome uh, this evening. And uh, as far as I know, it's November, I think the 23rd, mm -hmm. the 23rd of November. Um, thanks very much for uh, joining us for uh, our November session of the um, Neurodiversity Masterclass series. Must remember this time to introduce myself. My name is Beth Kilkenny. I am a project manager in UCD. And also here this evening, uh, we have a colleague of mine at the University, Valerie Andrews, and uh, one of our external partners, uh, Ken Kilbride, who's with ADHD Ireland. And uh, most importantly, <laughs> we have uh, Lorna Hamilton, who's going to be our uh, speaker um, this evening. So um, I'm going to introduce now Lorna in mo one moment. She'll give her presentation and just a note to say that, as usual, um, we'll do maybe 20 to 30 minutes of um of Lorna's session, and then we'll open up for Q and A afterwards. So, if you do have any questions as as Lorna goes along, just pop them in the the Q and A function, and we can pick them up from there. So, uh, Lorna Hamilton is associate professor of De developmental psychology at York St John University, where she leads on a number of inclusive education initiatives. Her research explores diversity in learning and cognition across the lifespan with a current focus on how educational experiences relate to mental health and well-being in neurodivergent learners. Lorna's PhD examined contextual factors in the reading and language development of children with a family history of dyslexia and developmental language disorder. And she's currently working with autistic and neurodivergent children and young people in participatory projects to understand how schools and universities can provide educational experiences that enable the widest range of learners to thrive. Uh, Lorna's research is funded by the Sir Halley Stewart Trust, NIHR and Experimental Psychology Society, and she is Associate Head of School for Psychology at York St. John University and a Senior Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Lorna is going to speak this evening on designing for neurodiversity, applying universal design and compassionate pedagogy, pedagogy, pedagogy <laughs> in higher education. OK, thanks very much, Lorna. You can go ahead. Thank you, Beth. Um, and it's lovely to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation. So please just bear with me for one minute while I do the normal faffing of trying to share my slides. Uh, let's just get that on presenter mode. Oh, that's no. Can is that on the right mode or is it on presenter mode? Because I've got a double screen and I have a feeling it's just switched to the wrong screen. That's yeah, we can see where right, we that's present from. I think we can see your notes there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excuse me. Try one more time. Okay. Okay. Is that now on the slide slideshow? Excellent. Got there eventually. Right. Um. So. Uh. Hello. Go. Hello again. And um. Thank you for the warm welcome and for attending this session today. I'm really looking forward to uh discuss discussions. So um as Beth said in her kind introduction, um I'm a developmental psychologist um and I've always been interested in neurodiversity in one way or another. Um, it's, and really, in the last couple of years, having done lots of work in schools, I've begun to think about um, how we can better serve our neurodivergent students in higher education contexts. Um, uh, I'm sure, like many of you, uh, we've seen a really rapid increase in the number of neurodivergent students that we're seeing at university over the last 10 years or so that I've been um, in my current institution. Uh, which is fantastic. They perhaps have always been there, but you know, not disclosing or not um, uh, diagnosed. But we're certainly aware of a much higher proportion of neurodivergent students um, in our university classrooms. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and this is really based on um, work that I've done in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Petty, who also works here at York St. John. She's a clinical psychologist and um, academic. And uh, that's, what led us, that's, that's what has led us to think about this concept of compassion in relation to higher education pedagogy. Okay. So, um, why compassion? 
Um, it's perhaps one of those words that has a, a little bit of a, a bad rep in, current, in the current climate, a little bit uh, touchy-feely. Um, but we, we started focusing on the idea of um, compassion. It's really a coming together of ideas from Stephanie's clinical practice and my um, developmental research with neurodivergent pupils. Um, so it's always good to start with uh, trying to define your, your key constructs, isn't it? So um, by compassion, you know, we're talking about more than a feeling, more than, more than kindness. Um, compassion as a, as a psychological construct is understood as a, a motivational force. So of all the definitions we've, uh, we've, we've looked at, they tend to have two things in common, two components. So um, compassion involves the propensity to notice distress, both in oneself and in other people. And then the motivation to act to prevent or to alleviate uh, that distress. Um, and the reason why we've started thinking about compassion in relation particularly to neurodivergent members of our university commu um, community is that, again, both from uh, my school work and Stephanie's clinical work, um, the common theme with all of the neurodivergent children, young people and adults we work with is a sense of shame. Um, a sense of shame and not belonging and um, as though being oneself is not enough and you know unfortunately that tends to be built up through cumulative negative experiences um, through the lifespan and um, many of which happen in educational contexts um, and as clinicians working in compassion focused therapy type paradigms uh, will say the, what we know from a psychological point of view is the antidote to shame um, and self-criticism is compassion towards the self. And that's why we started um, kind of honing in on this concept as potentially something that could be useful in order to develop our own pedagogical practice. Um, so yeah, and, and Nussbaum, uh, Martha Nussbaum, a philosopher, um, uh, has written uh, very beautifully on compassion and, and particularly on its teachability, which is also sort of an appealing, um, uh, appealing aspect of compassion, I suppose, that we develop compassion um, through interaction with people that are different from us, through exposure to others and their, and their, their distress, um, both in the real world, but also, I guess, in fictional um, context as well. So it's kind of conversations in this space that really focusing, you know, really kind of coming together on this idea of, of, of shame through through feeling different, the, the cumulative experiences, that feeling different, feeling as if you're not enough as you are and, and how that can lead to our students um, having made it through um, the, the school environment, reaching us at university with this you know, really pervasive sense that they are, they're expecting failure, they're expecting difficult interaction um, and, and um, yeah, and, and how, how that plays out when, when, when they reach the university classroom. So I'm sure many of you uh, will be familiar with uh, Bronwyn van Brenner's bioecological model of human development. I think it is quite useful um, just to contextualize the things we're talking about. If you're thinking about the neurodivergent student at the center of these nested um, contexts in which they live. Um, so we can think about the student within the microsystems of the university. So in the, the, the environments that are most psychologically close to the student. So in uh, pedagogical interactions in the classroom, both with peers and with uh, educators, uh, with disability services for whom um, certainly in many universities and ours included, you know, students have to really advocate for their own needs and often really frame themselves in quite a deficit focused way in order to access accommodations that ideally would just be um, uh, freely given. Um, how that can be really in conflict to um, the neurodiversity paradigm and how, which has really, um, I guess, upended the way we think about uh, neurocognitive difference and developmental, um, neurodevelopmental conditions such as autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and so on. Uh, whereas the neurodiversity movement and the neurodiversity scientific paradigm is encouraging people to, to think in a much more holistic way about both strengths and uh, difficulties, um, about environmental factors that enable and so on, in order to access um, support in universities, students often have to go and to disability, disability services and list these, here are all the things that I can't do, therefore I need um, these accommodations. 
The MESO system is the in interactions between those environments, which are in university settings uh, are not always as smooth or as um, uh, streamlined as we might like. So how uh, educators interact with disability services and registry and processes and all those things. Um, at the exosystem we can conceptualize as the university structures and processes. Um, I'm not sure about how it works in the Irish system, but I know that in the English system, these are not always the most transparent. They're not always um, the most enabling, and sometimes they can really um, act to as a barrier um, for our neurodivergent students. And then at the macro system level, um, of course, higher education funding is um, constantly shifting and uh, funding for disability services and provision and so on changes. The, the way that we understand disability, the societal discourses um, are constantly shifting. And then importantly at the bottom there, the chrono system, that how, how, how all of these systems interact and change over time. And um, as a developmental psychologist, and um, that's particularly of interest to me and in thinking about the journey that the students have taken through educational systems, um, even before they arrive with us at university. Um, so I've been involved in some um, school-based studies with neurodivergent pupils for quite some years now. And um, so this is looking at the level of the students within the um, bioecological model. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I guess this is, this is also looking at the chronic system. So how, how our students arrive with us. Um, and I guess a, a common feature of the various studies I've been involved with is really trying to center the neurodivergent pupils voice because it struck me that that's really been what's missing in, in the developmental literature about um, how autistic ADHD, uh, other, other neurodivergent students experience their school experience, um, experience the school environment, sorry. Um, a lot of that literature takes perspectives of parents and teachers and clinicians, whereas the, the pupil voice is, is, tends to be quite absent. And there may be many different reasons for those for that. So this is one study um, that we completed um, last year, um, small scale, um, but uh, in depth. So we worked for, for um, four years with a small group of autistic pupils, several of whom were multiply neurodivergent, so also with dual di diagnosis of ADHD and um, other conditions. And we work with them from year six, which is the final year of primary school in England, uh, to year nine, which is the third year of secondary school. Um, and we did annual interviews with the young people themselves, um, with their parents and with their teachers. So with stakeholders to really understand um, what goes on into uh, as, as these children move from the primary to the secondary environment, and then particularly through those early years of secondary school, because there's, there's good evidence now to suggest that that is where um, education can become, become particularly uh, difficult um, for autistic pupils. Um, in England, the secondary environments are much, um, much larger, much busier. The social environment is much more complex. The sensory environment is much more challenging. Um, and so we know from you know, good, uh, good evidence that many autistic children in mainstream settings um, face periods of exclusion. And there's much more school um, emotion-based school avoidance, school absence. Um, there's uh, academic attainment that is below potential. There are all sorts of outcomes that are, are less favorable for this group of pupils compared with their neurotypical peers. So we wanted to, to know the perspectives of the child and um, important people uh, in their lives and also collect some annual measures um, of things like mental health and bullying through that period. Uh, we've published the, the project on the university website, which I'm very happy to share afterwards if people are interested. Um, so the majority of, of, the, of the data analysis that we did here was um, qualitative thematic analysis, but just as a, a, a flavor of the sorts of things we found, just working with 15 young people. So we found two of the 15 were moved to special school provision following periods of exclusion. And in fact, one of those um, was then excluded from special school provision and ended up in uh, inpatient care by the time he... Uh, he was 14. Uh, the majority of children uh, reported um, being bullied at school uh, um, over prolonged periods of time. Uh, three of those 10 reported that they were punished for retaliating to bullies. This was a really common theme and anxiety around um, uh, really strong anxiety about being in trouble at school and uh, um, 
a real sense of injustice of being punished when they were the instigator of the negative interaction and also a real fear about being disciplined for behaviours which, which they perceived to be characteristic of autism. Um, so, for example, not wanting to participate in contact sports or asking direct questions in class. There was a real sense of, if I do what comes naturally to me, I, I will be punished for it. For over half of the children, their difficulties at school were managed by reducing their timetable, so doing fewer academic subjects. And parents reported that was often without consultation and often in subjects where the children actually had academic strength. Um, but there, were, uh, there was a perception that, for example, subjects like um, religious education might not be suitable for autistic pupils because of uh, literal difficulties with non-literal thinking, whereas, in fact, for many, several of the children, that was a real strength. Six of the 15 by age 14 had periods where they felt unable to go to school, so uh, prolonged periods of ab absence. And, you know, most concerningly, 12 of the 15 reported the development of mental health difficulties or emotion distress through that period. So it's a small sample um, and it's, uh, you know, we don't claim to be generalizable, but it r raised a number of, of themes um, that we found really troubling. Um, I'll just give one little example of, of um, because we've been following up with some of these children now as they've just finished their GCSEs at age um, 16. And one young man who's academically extremely um, able and uh, achieved a fantastic set of exam results uh, shared with us a well-being chart that he'd, be, he'd been keeping every day at school for two years. We'd ranked his well-being on a scale and he'd marked periods where his well-being had dipped and it was pretty much always associated with difficulties with peers, so falling out with friends. And in discussing those difficulties with us, um, he always blamed himself. He all, always um, thought it was his fault that, the, that this interaction had gone wrong. So it's kind of just an illustration of this sort of sense of shame and that, it, that is uh, inherent with difference. So yeah, just to pick up on this theme of emotion-based school avoidance, um, again, I'm not sure what the situation in Ireland is, but this is something that's a really hot topic um, in England at the moment. The Children's Commission has just published a report on this and described school absence as, uh, in the post-pandemic context as um, at crisis level. Um, so yeah, persistent absence from school has doubled since pre-COVID um, in the UK. Um, we know from NHS data that probable mental health difficulties has been, was on the rise pre-COVID. Um, uh, there's a rise from uh, in seven to 16 year olds, according to NHS data, to one in six uh, children with a probable mental health difficulty in 2020. And actually just this week, they published updated longitudinal data and it's risen again to one in five uh, young people between seven and 16 with a probable mental health difficulty. We know that a, you know, a sizable proportion of those children um, that are missing from school and um, displaying significant anxiety around school are neurodivergent. Um, and so this is the this is the the chrono system, the the context in which our neurodivergent students are currently uh, reaching us at university. And um, I think that has real implications for um, how how universities uh, need to support these students. So um, there are lots of barriers for neurodivergent students in accessing higher education. Uh, so some that we picked out in our, in our paper were um, often neuronormative expectations of student behavior. So um, things like maintaining eye contact in class or um, uh, yeah, rather than uh, as a lot of neurodivergent students might report, you know, preferring to keep eyes closed or, or look at a um, non-stimulating part of the room, like a blank wall in order to concentrate, but that being interpreted um, as um, uh, negatively. And um, so this really gets at the, the, what Damien Milton calls the double empathy problem um, applied to the classroom, how interactions between actors of different neurotypes can uh, fail because of different expectations of each other, different uh, dispos dispositions and different experiences in the world. There are, of course, neurodivergent specific learning challenges. So for dyslexic students, you know, the very heavy reliance on um, written communication can be a barrier. Um, I found that ADHD students can really struggle uh, with feedback, um, rejection sensitivity and uh, working constructively with feedback on their work, um, achieving a sense of 
belonging in the university campus can be a barrier for autistic students. We also mentioned that, that the bolt-on support services, which I mentioned earlier, so the need to um, spend weeks or months at the beginning of their university careers uh, convincing disability uh, services of their deficits in order to access support rather than um, rather than curricula being designed for diversity. And as I've uh, mentioned now um, several times, this shame, I think, that is built up through negative educational experiences throughout the lifespan, um, which is uh, absolutely not uh, um, bashing schools or teachers who do a fantastic job, but um, we know from talking to these young people that educational um, mainstream educational settings pose a lot of challenges for, for them. So what do we mean by comp compassionate pedagogy? Um, well, it borrows core concepts from the therapy, from compassion-focused therapy, um, concepts of warmth, uh, of, of trying to um, uh, facilitate warmth from the self to the self and from the self to the others, to create places of belonging, um, safe spaces in university campuses, and education that is neurodiversity affirming. So that's particularly relevant for a psychologist like me who will be teaching about neurodiversity to neurodivergent students. So um, the kind of uh, uh, content that uh, affirms neurodiversity um, rather than positions it as something that needs fixing or um, within the more medical model um, apologizing approach. Um, so Howe wrote a nice paper in uh, 2011 about applying um, compassionate pedagogy to first generation students. Um, and they describe it as a commitment to identify and change institutional and classroom practices that place minoritized students at a further disadvantage. Um, and I, I really like this. This is uh, having the confidence as an educator to acknowledge where your own institutional practices might be the problem and um, to find ways to disrupt or challenge those processes for the benefit of, of your students. Um, and crucially, I think compassionate pedagogy can only take place in a whole institution approach in that sort of bioecological model with, with all of the university um, ecosystem working together, so a systems working. Educators can only be, uh, can, are enabled to be compassionate um, teachers when they are working within a compassionate institution, which is perhaps not always the case. Um, so how can we make the higher education classroom neurodiversity affirming? Um, so thinking about the, the classroom as a, as a microsystem. So I've been working with a great group of uh, people in the Fort team. And if, you, um, if anyone's interested in open research, open reproducible research, uh, this group are really fantastic. And um, they're uh, about um, uh, teaching open and uh, open research and research integrity within the university curriculum. And they have a neurodiversity subgroup who do really excellent work um, around uh, open science and neurodiversity. So with a with a colleague in that group, Magda Gross Hodger, we, we've we've developed a set of lesson plans uh, aimed at, um, uh, I guess, challenging some of the some of the discrimination that we we sometimes see in in psychology curricula, um, which I'm owning the problems in my own discipline. Um, they're available on the Open Science Framework with a link at the bottom there if anyone's interested. So three things that we, we suggest here is raising awareness of neurodiversity in the classroom, um, openly challenging the deficit focus, which has been uh, quite pervasive in the psychology curriculum, um, and increasing the representation of neurodivergent scholars. So one of the activities that Fort is engaged in is um, putting together a database of uh, published work by neurodivergent scholars, which I think is great, particularly when you're teaching around neurodiversity. Um, talking about difference openly and with empathy, so um, using language mindfully, avoiding pathologizing terminology. So Monique both uh, wrote very, very um, movingly about this in a, a paper, and she's a, uh, they're, they're an autistic um, psychologist, uh, academic and, and, and advocate. And uh, in that paper from 2020, um, they wrote, as an undergraduate in my penultimate year, my academic introduction to autism was in a, in a module entitled Abnormal Psychology. I was taught about autistic people, um, how autistic people have impaired theory of mind and told that people with autism would struggle to understand the perspectives, experiences and emotions of others. 
there is no cure was how I was introduced to applied behavioral analysis as the only scientifically sound treatment for autism, the goal of which was to teach children to bridge across their intrinsic deficits and into non-autistic communication and sensibility. As I tried to express my own experiences as an, as an autistic in class, I would be shut down because of my lack of objectivity and because I could not possibly put myself in the shoes of the person with severe autism. I spent a lot of time being taught that I lacked theory of mind by people who couldn't grasp that my experience of and with autism were fundamentally different to the accounts being taught. I found that account just you know, really powerful in terms of um, challenging the way um, that we talk about and teach some of these topics within the psychology curriculum. And then crucially, I think delivering for a diverse student audience. So beginning to think about how we can design our teaching uh, differently to be prepared for all sorts of diversity in the classroom. So moving away from these sort of bolt on adjustments and, you, and harnessing strength based approaches so allowing students to work within their, um, their individual strengths. Um, I've got an eye on time. I think we need about five more minutes if that's okay. Um, so I've just begun trialing some of this within my own work. I'm not pretending at all to have all of the silver bullets or know how to, to do this well. Um, I've done no uh, really objective evaluation. It is a work in progress and a reflection on my own practice. So um, universal design for learning um, uh, is, is an approach which is aimed to um, cater for all of the neurocognitive diversity that we, we see in, in our classrooms of students. So I, I was um, writing and delivering a new module last year um, on neurodiversity and development. It was a small class at the first time it had run. So I thought, well, if I can't trial some of these approaches here, when can I? Uh, even within a small class, a third of the students had a declared um, disability or neurodivergence. Um, so UDL um, promotes multiple, basically flexibility and autonomy in, in learning and in giving students choice in how they access and how they um, engage and how they demonstrate their learning. So um, I won't go through any of this in detail. I'm very happy to answer questions on it, but um, by multiple means of engagement, it's um, various tools in terms of trying to um, give students uh, flexibility in how, how, I rec how we recruited their interest, um, sustain their effort, and gave them options for self-regulation. So some of these techniques were uh, partially co-creating the curriculum. Um, allowing multiple means of communication with me as the, as the, as the teacher, no forced participation in class, um, a choice in the focus of assignment and so on, a choice in how feedback was received. Um, that was, yeah, that was um, an interesting one, which I'd not tried before, but asking students as they submitted work, how would you like to receive the feedback? Would you like to come and talk to me? Would you like written feedback? Would you like audio feedback? Um, and uh, particularly for students with ADHD, that seemed to work well. Uh, multiple means of representation in terms, uh, in order to facilitate um, comprehension. So, uh, video module overviews, uh, glossaries of key terms, lots of different kind of text videos, podcasts, um, infographics to to support the the core um, lecture content. And then multiple means of action and expression. So building in movement. Um, so allowing students to kind of leave the class to go and do sort of um, action research and then come back and report. Yeah, choice in how to participate in in-class activities in groups by themselves um, as preferred, making it very clear that all was acceptable. And then in one, one of the um, assessments, um, uh, uh, flexible format. So uh, the original assignment was a information sheet for practitioners. Um, so translating scientific knowledge into, uh, for a general uh, audience and um, managed to persuade the university registry to, to flex this so students could do it in any format they want. So some stuck to an information sheet, there were blogs, there were podcasts, there were videos, there were um, in-person um, presentations, recorded presentations, and uh, absolutely to my delight, an absolutely fantastic animation from one of our neurodivergent students and in a psychology uh, BSc curriculum, uh, as far as I'm aware, you know, they, students with that kind of talent to uh, creative talent don't get other opportunities to um, to use them. So that was really great to see. <laughs> Informal and entirely subjective um, evaluation. You know, everyone passed. Attendance was much better than we sometimes see in our in our classes. Students liked it. 
And all of the students, whether they um, identified as neurodivergent or disabled or not, um, agreed that the universal design elements had helped them to engage with the module. So um, the amount of choice made it our module just as much as yours. Um, it made it easier to take in more information without feeling overwhelmed. And one of the critiques of UDL is often, you know, how do you maintain quality? How do you ma maintain standards with that much flexibility? Um, so particularly perhaps around, you know, supplementing uh, traditional science papers with, um, you know, less less formal um, uh, media such as podcasts and so on. I was very pleased that one student said that having podcast videos and blogs available supported my engagement outside the classroom. I found that I was more likely to do my own further reading following my interests after having started with a podcast or something. So that was that was great. I did ask for um, the neurodivergent students in the class if they'd be willing to give um, testimonials because um, I'd, I'd love to be able to roll this kind of approach out more widely. So I'll just uh, briefly uh, read what they said. So a student with a dual diagnosis of autism and ADHD said, I found it easier to contribute to discussions in this module because I don't feel pressured to contribute. Being able to choose the format of our assessment has been very helpful for me. I was able to choose a creative format that I have experience with. The sessions included breaks, partner and group discussions, and often group research in the library, which gives me breaks from sitting still and makes it easier to concentrate and take in more content in different ways. Uh, a, a second student who's awaiting an autism assessment said, I struggled socially in my first year at university, which was made worse by COVID restrictions. In contrast to others, I enjoyed online learning. Learning at my own pace, online in my own home was ideal for me. This comfort didn't extend to my second year. I found the lights and the lectures too bright. I felt unable to ask for help within large groups. and I often struggled with fatigue, resulting in me missing lectures. The structure of this module comes from a place of understanding about neurodivergent brains, which has massively helped me to feel comfortable. I get to follow what I'm interested in and complete the assignment in the best way for me, which I believe has improved the quality of my work. I still struggle with noises from inside and outside the building, and the lights still hurt my eyes, but I know that I'm not going to be chastised or singled out for wearing my headphones or looking away from the board, which allows me to do the things I need to do to keep learning and stay engaged. So again, it's just a, a, an articulation of the things that have previously been a barrier um, where they perhaps really didn't need to be an extremely able student who's gone on to do a, a prestigious master's. Um, but again, just a, that, that idea of the kind of cumulative expectations of um, educational environments being hostile. And I have linked to the uh, video, um, uh, the this, um, animation that uh, one of the neurodivergent students produced. Um, for reasons of time, I won't play you lots, but I'll just give you a little clip because this just blew my mind. I mean, I had no idea that students in my class had these creative talents because, you know, usually they don't have any opportunity to um, uh, demonstrate them, just to give you an idea. They pulled into their interests. The term was coined by Murray, Lesser and Lawson in 2005 in a paper called Attention, Monotropism and the Diagnostic Criteria for Autism. The monotropic mind experiences higher arousal for fewer interests, while the polytropic mind experiences lower arousal for a wider variety of interests. As a result of this, it can be harder for autistic people to attend to things outside of their attentional tunnel. Sudden interruption to their focus can cause intense distress and discomfort for an autistic person. So, what does monotropism explain? I'll leave it there for reasons of time, but uh, needless to say, the uh, student did very well and they're now uh, starting their own um, animation business, which is fantastic. Um, they're working with us, in fact, on some of our projects and um, producing animations on the research that we're doing. And I would never have known they had this talent um, had they not engaged in this assessment in this way, because I don't think they would have told me. Um, right. Common autistic oh. traits. Okay, um, last slide. Um, so I just wanted to um, uh, flag um, a project that just started um, at York St. John. So this is part of our um, Institute of Social Justice, uh, which runs a grant scheme where academics can partner with uh, local charities and organisations. Um, and we've partnered with an absolutely fantastic organisation called Spectrum First, which, is, um, which provides uh, mentoring for neurodivergent students um, over... I think 60% of their employees are neurodivergent themselves. Um, they do really, really great work. So we're absolutely delighted to be partnered with them. So we're just in the design and ethics phase at the moment for, for this project, our new project, in Inclusive Neurodiverse Campuses, 
But what we're aiming to do in this is kind of get beyond the microsystem of the classroom and look at the whole campus um, as, a, as an ecosystem. Um, we're looking at where are the feasible points of intervention for improving practices across HE systems to give them the most return for neurodivergent students and staff in the community. By which we mean belonging, learning, progression, well-being, employ employability outcomes, and so on. So it's going to be a critical participatory action research project. We've just um, hired an absolutely fantastic postdoc to it, and we're going to be launching all sorts of um, uh, installations on campus um, to um, I map zones of best practice, map where things are going well so that we can learn um, learn from others' good practice. And that is it. So to, to sum up, um, compassion is an antidote to shame and a mechanism for change in education, I think. Um, it's so important when working with neurodivergent university students to consider the educational um, experiences that they bring with them from school. Um, beginning to um, to play with the potential of universal design for learning and strength-based approaches to facilitate a neurodiversity affirming classroom and uh, just starting to ask how we can develop whole campus approaches to create more compassionate higher education for our neurodivergent students and with that thank you very much for listening Thank you very much for that, Laurie. You know, that was a, a, an exceptionally interesting uh, presentation. Um, I, I would particularly take that at the start where you started defining terms, but maybe we could go back a little bit further and you know, ask you the question in terms of what is the purpose of education? And does that purpose change for people with neurodiverse divergent conditions? That is a great question. Um, so I suppose, uh, I think another reason why compassionate pedagogy um, is having a little bit of a uh, resurgence at the moment is because certainly in this country, we're seeing um, a very utilitarian conception of what university is for. Um, the Office of Students in this country is mainly interested in graduate outcomes and uh, you know uh, potential earning capacity and so on, which is not unimportant. Um, however, um, I would argue it's not the only or main purpose of education. Education should be transformative um, it should, um, change minds and allow allow people to discover their talents and their and their strengths um, and i think now more than ever we really need neurodivergent brains working on the problems that society has faced we really need brains that can think differently and um you know there's there's good experimental research on that right you know problem solving works better when you've got diversity going on um, mm. but anyone's been following the uh, uh Hopefully you're not seeing so much of it in Ireland, but the um, the COVID inquiry in the UK, okay, and, yes. you know, the, the basic what's going on there is is a, a a group of leaders with absolutely no diversity, you know, working on a really really difficult problem. Um, we need to to be making education um, inclusive and enabling for for people who think differently. Um, is my view. And so oh, I don't I don't think it has to be different for neurodivergent learners. I just think it has to enable neurodivergent learners to achieve the same uh, outcomes um, that they're capable of as neurotypical learners. Just in, in the same sort of vein, there's a couple of questions and I'm going to uh, put them all together. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, Coco was asking, you know, um, she's from outside the, uh, the UK and Ireland. Um, and what do you mean by UDL? Um, there's another question came in from Susan Madigan. And um, she says, was the resistance to implementing UD and UDL for academics, do you think? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, fairly new to the, the topic. I'm sure there are, there are people who are better qualified to answer this than me. So what I've encountered so far um, in my own institution and talking about it more widely, I think it's, um, well, I think there are two things. I think um, one is um, concerns about consistency, quality. Um, you know, we, we are assessed by quality standards and, and the quality assurance. We have to show... Um, that we're meeting those and, and perhaps when you're using more flexible um, uh, autonomous means of teaching I think it doesn't always fit well with our registry systems and uh, university systems so I think that's part of it but I think that's that can be overcome and the other thing I think with um, academic stuff I think you know all the academic stuff 
I work with want to do the best by their students. There's no, you know, there's, but they're also under huge pressure from all sorts of things. And I, it's the same with school teachers. It's time. It's rethink. It's having the time and the headspace to rethink the way you deliver things. And um, I was able to uh, design this module differently because for the first time in ten years in university, I actually had a semester of teaching um, and time to think. And I, I think that's, you know, that's part of it, isn't it? Educators, educators everywhere are under pressure. Thank you very much. Um, there's a couple of questions coming in from Natalie, um, just on your research, and I, again, I can try and put them together. Um, how big a portion of your research model included non-Caucasians or people of a mixed heritage background? Same question, but with economic inclusion perspective. Um, I was also wondering, you know, what portion would be female and aged over 35? Um, excellent questions. Um, so uh, neurodiversity paradigm, it's, it's a big um, it's a big topic at the moment is intersectionality and how neurodivergence intersects with other um, other identities. Um, basically, in every paper I've written on neurodivergence in schools, in the limitation section, it says um, they're all majority white British. Um, when I'm working with children, we, tr um, we tried really hard to um, recruit more girls. Um, it's very difficult when you're working with primary school age children because most but, girls that haven't got had their diagnosis by that stage you know if, when girls at neurodivergent girls are struggling they're typically being uh, pushed from pillar to post in mental health services and you know it's often not till adolescence or adulthood that someone says you know do you think there might be ADHD or autism going on um so in our current project which my PhD student Catherine is learn, uh, is leading uh, where we're using creative almost UDL methods to work with individual neurodivergent students to try and elicit that you know really center their voices um we have three out of um 15 girls there um three girls out of 15 there um which and that was after a lot of trying a lot of trying socioeconomic um difference uh much better so we do have a really good range uh, in all of us our ch child samples um and so most of my work has been with children and young young people um in in some recently published work um and uh some work again that some of doctorate students are doing um we are working with older, older neurodivergent people, but again, that's a massive gap, right? Um, is knowing about neurodivergence in um, in later life. So, in in brief, uh, not not as much diversity as I would like, but um, very aware of that as a limitation. I just want to spend, I mean, it's just not one of the questions came in, but just one of the things you touched on there, um, and it's something we would you know work on in ADHR, and I know other organisations work on it too. And you mentioned neurodiversity there and women. Um, and picking the girls and autism and ADHD not being picked up early. Um, is it too late to be putting in the systems that you're suggesting in third level? And perhaps it should be done much further back? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think it should. And from my work with schools, I think sometimes it is, but it's it tends to be the same as I'm seeing in universities, it's pockets of good practice. It's not mm. um it's not systematic, so it's not tending to come in a um, top down policy way it's you know where where uh, individual teachers are really passionate about this sort of thing they they will adapt their, their practices in this way um but it's not yet systematic so i think there's lots and lots of work still to do and actually um some data i've just collected um which was a a, a survey with english school staff um basically on um uh, the training that they get in uh, university and the short answer to that is quite a few don't get any training at all even when they're training to be teachers um when they do it can quite often be an afternoon to cover everything to do with special educational needs as it's called in, in uh, uh, england and um you know uh, i think there's a lot of goodwill um but not enough training and support um but i i, I feel like there's you know there's there's a groundswell i think there's, there's movement towards you know the neurodiversity paradigm is gaining traction in in, in schools Certainly, I agree with you, it is uh, developing and it is, um, I think we will get there. Uh, yeah. We're not there at the moment, but it, no. it, it will happen, yes. Yeah. And um, just in then, I think it's going to the other end of the spectrum, just a little bit in terms of, you know, the growth and development. And this comes in from Eleanor McSherry. Um, I design continuing professional development certificates for industry on your diversity. The aim is to create a culture of inclusion. Do you think this can be done? And do we have a responsibility in higher education to lead the way on this? Uh, great questions. Yeah. Um, yes, I think the, the question. 
Yes, I think we absolutely have a um, responsibility in higher education. That's one of the things we argued, um, stuff in my paper earlier this year, that in a way, a university should be the absolute ideal context for neurodivergent people, right? And um, this is the, type, the life stage where you can follow your interests in as much depth as you want. You have more autonomy over your schedule. Um, you know, you can learn in a way that is more suitable for you, you know, kind of released from the strictures of school and, and before. So it should be a great place for neurodivergent learners and for inclusion. I don't think it always is yet. Um, I think uh, training for employers is so important. Uh, it's so important. That's great work that you're doing. Thanks for doing it. Um, I, <laughs> I see a lot on LinkedIn and so on at the moment, which I would describe as neurodiversity light. There's a lot of employers out there going, oh, you know, neurodiversity awareness, this, that, and the other. And uh, it's not always quite, I think, getting at the the level of um, understanding that you might quite want, but but like awareness is better than than nothing, um, and let's hope that we're we're moving from awareness to real acceptance and designing workplaces for difference. Yeah. Um, just going back then, there's another couple of questions that they were uh, came in from the chat, um, and this goes back to the I think you're researching. You were suggesting that you know. Um, people would also wear being bullied. And I think they were saying, I found school to be a horrible place. The bullying was wife and widespread. And I would not recommend schools to anyone. I wonder how anybody can heal from this experience. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And, and you know, really sadly, you know, that just absolutely chimes with, you know, what the young people have said to us. Um, <laughs> I mean, isn't it terrible that, you know, school, you know, the which is mainly filled with, you know, decent people trying to do the right thing by pupils, you know, um, is so traumatizing for so many neurodivergent people. It really, really is. And, you know, it, it, the word trauma is overused a bit, perhaps, but, you know, I mean, genuinely is, I think, a, you know, a cumulative trauma that neurodivergent students go through in, in school. Um, can anything be done about it i mean i have to say yes because otherwise i'd stop doing <laughs> to what i do I, I, you've got to be optimistic that it can um uh that research can make a difference that neurodivergent activism can make a difference i mean literally when i was teaching so i did my phd in dyslexia and dld so, uh, graduated in 2013 so 10 years ago um with great people but the whole language at that time you know was so different to how it is now. The, the neurodiversity paradigm, which has been spearheaded by neurodivergent scientists, um, has absolutely transformed the way we understand these things. You know, uh, the theory of mind deficit in autism is no longer to point our programs, whereas, you know, uh, 10 years ago, that, that was it. Um, that was how we understood autism. So let's believe that uh, progress is possible um, and that schools can be a less hostile place for neurodivergent learners. And, uh, oh, sorry. I was just curious as well, Lorna, speaking of, of progress, um, you, you know, how long you've been doing this work for um, in York, St. John's, because it's something at UCD that, you know, when you talk about building awareness, we've been kind of um, doing these uh, kind of outward facing events, the masterclass, and we've done some conferences for really since we started doing them around 2020. And then there's a body of work happening within the university kind of education and the UDL and all that. But when you're working with large institutions, it's a it's a it is a long process. So I'm just wondering kind of where you started and, and where you are like along the along the line. Um, well, I think I've only really started applying the schools, I think, you know, the schools work I have been focused on, you know, children. Um, for most of my research career, I think I've only really started applying it really deliberately um, to higher education practice sort of three or four years ago. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to work out the best ways of influence. So I have been in a head of department uh, position. I'm shortly to step aside from that and joining a inclusive education working group at university level to try and embed some of these principles. So you know, I'm sure like you, you know, running with Stephanie running CPD sessions um, uh, with our neurodivergent students. Um, 
I don't I don't know how long it's going to take and, and and whether we'll ever completely get there. I don't know. Um, but I do I do feel like there's a groundswell. You know, as I was as we were writing our paper earlier, you know, saw the there was a neurodiversity and higher education conference advertised in Bristol, which you know I've ne I'd never seen that before. Um, and so I went to that in September, and it was fantastic. You know, there were people from there were lecturers and academics, there were professional services staff, there were uh, postgraduate researchers, neurotypical, neurodivergent. You know, people in the audience, you know, had no idea about neurodiversity and just wanted to learn people who you know were completely embedded in it it was such a positive event um i think it's easy to get discouraged because you know and and the other thing that i i would say that when you is when you're completely ensconced in the sort of neurodiversity mindset and the way the way of thinking um it's kind of easy to think everyone's there with you and um uh it's easy to forget that actually um yeah you have to do a lot of that gap filling I think I think it's a project of years and years, right? Um, mm. No, absolutely. You kind of you, when you're talking about it all the time, you think that everybody else is kind of <laughs> is talking about it all the time, and and that's not the case. I'll just take one of the questions from the Q and A here, and then I'll let Valerie jump in with a question. So there's um, a question here from Sandra Finnegan, who um, says, as someone with ADHD who is hoping to return to education and do a degree after unsuccessfully attempting to as a teenager. What should I do to prepare for the higher education environment? What questions should I be asking of the college and who should I be asking those questions of? Yeah, um, okay, great question. Um, so I'm assuming this is in the Irish context, so excuse me if I get the terminology wrong, but pr pr probably it's quite similar, right? It's, it's um, similar from what, from what you said so far, I think, yeah. Um, I would definitely be looking through university web, or the universities and colleges that you're interested in, I would definitely be looking through their web pages. Um, they're not always the easiest to navigate, but um, there is, there's good work going on in a lot of places now. Um, I've been working with people in Exeter and Warwick universities who are you know, doing what sounds quite similar to what you're doing at UCD um, and identifying those institutions where you know, there is this sort of neurodiversity affirm affirming work going on, I think would be a really good starting point. Um, I think like whether, you know, when, where, if, when and how to disclose um, ADHD or, or autism is a, is a really personal decision. Um, and ideally, we get to a state in education where you don't have to disclose if you don't want to, because it's all just designed in an inclusive way. Um, but, you know, from the neurodivergent students that I, I work with, I, they tend to you know, I, th I think they find it empowering just to be able to talk, talk about it. So I think you need to you need to you need to go to open days, get a sense a sense of the place, and you need to talk to your course lead the course leader, and it'll give you a really good sense of the of the culture of the place. Right. I, I would be my suggestion. Um, and in terms of preparing yourself, um, <laughs> as an ADHD learner, you know there are there are lots of things that that, that are aversive. I I think um, if you could do some sort of if, if you've been out of higher education for a while and you've been in the workplace or or whatever you've been doing, you've had time hopefully to you know do some reflection and evaluation on your own strengths and diff and challenges. Um, so I, I I would I would say that I would say going in with a really clear strength of, uh, idea of what your strengths are, and um, and being confident about that and wherever you can following those um, you know whether that's through the optional modules that you choose or um, but yeah, I wish it wasn't all on you to do this, but sadly sometimes it is. Um, uh, being really firm in, you know, okay, this these like reading really long papers is going to be a challenge for me, but I know I can do this really well. Um, I've just finished a data collection for a study of ADHD or academics. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, the things that they talk about because the ADHD of brain could be absolutely brilliant for science and academic work. Um, you know. People talk about juggling loads of projects at the same time, having the ideas that no one else has had. Um, but it sometimes takes a little bit of time to get there in terms of fi finding your niche, finding finding your tribe, and not getting overwhelmed with the yeah, or finding a way to finding your own strategies for coping with the overwhelm when it comes, because it will. Because uh, degrees can be intensive, right? Good luck. Well, I was going to, uh, Beth um, stole my my idea there. I was going to voice Sandra's question there, which you've just answered. But Sandra had also said in the chat 
that um uh, all of these uh, all of all of your sides are full of excellent ideas as as someone who was di- undiagnosed and had a r- an horrific time and failed out of college you actually got me a little emotional she says that there are people like you out there who care is wonderful so that's a really uh, that's a great endorsement there um and so that, yeah that was sandra um now natalie had asked and apologies now if you reference this at some point but she says do you know of any real efforts for universities, including your own, who are who are going to be collaborating with intersectional professionals and the general public relevantly? Um, I think somebody else had asked further back as well about, you know, the transition from third level. Um, you know, we're, we're aware now of dealing with this at hopefully second level and, and very much third level. But then the transition into the workplace and into the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so are you aware of any efforts um, for of educators, you know, handling that or tackling that? Yeah, definitely. There is good work. Again, it's pockets and, uh, you know, it's not um, it's not widespread yet. But um, someone I collaborate with at Lancaster, John, Jonathan Vincent, um, uh, he's an education um, academic. He's co-designed um, a, kind of like a self um a self-study module um he co-designed with um autistic students autistic um uh adults in the workplace um an employability skills module which has been really successful um uh and the, the important part is it's co-designed it's um you know uh jonathan doesn't identify as autistic himself but um you know he, it's all worked with with the students that he's worked with through universities the employers that he's engaged with who are who are taking a neuroinclusive approach um I mean, that's one example. I'm, I'm aware of lots of people trying to do really good work in this space. Mark Fabry at Leeds. Um, yeah. Um, again, it's like schools. that the, It's pockets of good practice that at the moment is not, not necessarily joined up. But I, it, the work is happening. Um, mm. And uh, I think actually lots of people have put in, sorry to cut in, uh, lots of people have put various links to websites and help sites and stuff into the chat so you know obviously there are the you know we're more aware of 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 things than ever now but this we've still a long way to go as ken mentioned but there are there are resources out there but um you know it's in a perfect world this would all be you know be tackled at, at the relevant levels and everything but we're, we're we've a way to go yet but there's thankfully there are there are resources out there yeah yeah um yeah there, there really are and i think i think it's um I, I think it's a real area of focus at the moment and because you know the I, i'm not aware of the statistics for adhd but for autism like the um employment statistics are terrible you know i mean mm. given the the knowledge expertise and talent that's out there and um, so, you know woeful underuse of people's skills probably have time just for one more quick question and um, just for, for myself it's just it's a little bit of context um, I was out presenting on ADHD to one of the world's largest uh, finance, largest finance companies, um, and doing my research on them, they were worth forty nine. Are they manage assets, uh, forty nine trillion dollars? Um, I was obviously making the case for having people with ADHD. And you've made the same case there in terms of the academics, and uh, people with ADHD can be the game changers. And if you want to keep the organisation uh, diverse and changing, you need people with ADHD. But I was particularly intrigued by the question that came in from Declan Hogan. Um, how do you measure the impact or the return on investment of UDL? Yeah, so that's something really um, wrestling with at the moment. Um, it's really hard to um, organise, well, I don't know, without um, a really big grant. Um, anyway, it's really hard to organise um, <laughs> like proper, you know, randomised controlled trial of this stuff within universities. Um, it, I mean, it's very hard to do these kind of, you know, quite general education pro- um, program or approaches in an RCT design anyway. Um, you know, it's not like sort of comparing phonics reading teaching with, with other, te- you know, where, where you're comparing something that's, you know, like and like. UDL, yeah, it's so diverse and so personal and so flexible. It's, it's really hard to take that kind of robust evaluation uh, methodology. So um, I'm going to have to say I don't know yet. At the moment, I am totally in the sort of like trialing things seeing what the students tell me, taking on board their ideas phase. Um, but I would definitely like to move towards a more systematic evaluation of this kind of approach. I've, I have seen some uh, UDL um, uh, kind of a, a very, various different study designs, mainly coming from the States, um, 
which overall um, show small, if, if you look at the whole class, um, show small gains on you know sort of the way students feel about about their learning and and their belonging and which 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 map onto then attainment. My my very subjective small n um, observations are that the neurotypical students um, will attain attain the same level that they would have done anyway. It's no it's no detriment. You know they like it and it's fine and and they probably you know or many of them might be fine in in other uh, systems as well. But for neurodivergent students, you know, it conceptualized broadly in terms of students with mental health difficulties as well, um, it can make a real, real difference for those students. Cool. Well, thank you very and, much other, and, and other minoritized groups as well. Thanks for calling up the six. I'll, I'll hand back yeah. to Beth. Actually, I'll uh, six. <laughs> Um, that was um, that was really brilliant, Lona. Thanks so much. And there's so much engagement in the chat and in the Q and A. And we probably could have gone on for another half an hour at least, I'd say. But that's that's always the way <laughs> with these things, isn't it? So, um, thanks so much. Um, thanks so much for your time uh, this evening and for and for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you for all the brilliant questions.